All right, my friends, hey, what's up? It's good to see you guys. I'm excited. I know it's been about six weeks since I've done a video, and I think this is going to be a fun one, so just relax, grab a drink. June 20th, tomorrow, Saturday, June 20th, is going to be World Refugee Day. It was started, as you can see here, according to Wikipedia, 2000. It's done by the United Nations General Assembly, and we're just going to look at some facts because uh, some of my most favorite people that I met during my time in Lebanon were uh, folks who were coming out of deep struggle, um, Assyrian refugees. And so I want to look a little bit about what's going on. Um, I just thought it would be interesting to y'all. One of my goals is to, you know, to help people pray. And so one of the things I did in that way, because I know not everyone's going to move overseas and take jobs overseas. Um, but I know, I know you guys care for the world. I know you guys um, care for the lost and the hurting and physically we can only be at one place at one time. So, um, um, so I'm just going to throw this out. I did ask a couple of my friends. I said, look, uh, I'm asking my friends in the States to pray. Uh, let me know what you think. I said, you know, tell me, send me a message. Let me know what you think on the issue. What's going on? How should we pray? What are the most pressing issues? And they got back to me on that. So I thought that was really interesting. So anyways, this is the um, thing here. You can check it out. There's also going to be some stuff tomorrow. Like um, there was a free concert here. UN Refugee Agency. Uh, pretty fun uh, Spanish music. Uh, that's why I put the Spanish music in the background. Web Relief is a big organization that does a lot. And I think I'll post a link to a really interesting report that I read when I was in Lebanon. I'm going to scroll down here. Actually, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to do a little Q&A, see what, how you guys do on this quiz. So what country hosts the most refugees? Question number one, what country hosts the most refugees? You got it? Okay, time's up. Turkey has the world's largest refugee population, but Lebanon and Jordan are hosting the highest number relative to their population. In Lebanon, there are 164 refugees per 1,000 inhabitants, which equates to about one in six. So that's pretty interesting. Number two, which country takes in the most refugees in 2019? What do you think? What do you think? I'm gonna, I, I just looked at this, but I didn't really look clearly at it. I'm gonna go, I don't know. I'm gonna go Germany, I guess, I don't know. Canada led the world on this measure by resettling uh, 756 refugees per million residents. Australia did 510. Sweden did 493. Norway, 465. Um, and all these countries did uh, more per million than the United States. So there you go for U.S. viewers. What is the country that's best for refugees? What country is best for refugees? Well, support for taking in refugees varies around the world. About two-thirds or more of people in Mexico, Canada, Australia, and the United, United States and Japan say they support taking refugees from countries where people are fleeing violence or war. So, pretty interesting. Which countries need immigrants? One thing for folks in America, in the last 10 years, I think it was like right around 2010, of our total population growth, of that entire pie population growth, 70% of it in one of these years in the last 10 years came from immigration. So birth rates are really, really down in developed countries pretty much across the board, and it's real, real bad in Europe. So best countries for immigrants, Canada, uh, maybe because they're natural resources, maybe because of their um, social medicine and things like that, social programs. Also, they have a lot of land. Uh, Switzerland, Sweden, Australia, Germany, and the U.S. Let's do one more. Which country accepts the most immigrants? Well, that should be Turkey again, right? Uh, according to recent estimates from the UN 2015 report, in 2013, the United States, Germany, and Russia had the largest number of immigrants of any country, while Tuvalu and Tukuleo had the lowest. Okay, okay, that question made me look stupid. Anyways, so there you go. Um, all kinds of stuff. I'll let you guys check out the rest. So let's jump over to some of the comments that I had from my friend. Okay, so one person said, they said, I asked him, you know, hey, how, you know, how should we be praying, you know? I'm going to send out these prayer requests, how should we pray? And, and this person, they said, you can pray however you want. It's just asking Allah to help these people. But what I believe is that we can do more than pray for them if we really want to help. There's a lot of ways to help. I don't know if you agree with me, but thanks, really, for asking and praying. You're a really good man. Also, I think there's no specific day to pray for these people. It's not only for the Syrians living outside, but also inside. Because I think people who live inside now, they need us to pray for them now more than the people who live outside, especially with the new law made by the U.S. First of all, look, this person isn't um, English as a first language. When I met them, they were just, they were really struggling with English. Now look how good they're doing. Uh, the second thing is, what is this U.S. law? So I'm going to see if we can't figure that out. So another thing, uh, it really means a lot to me and you, these people, and hopefully Allah will hear you and help them. Big heart, all love to you and your friends. So way to go, you guys. Thank you for praying for them. So, hi, Brian. I miss you, bro. Actually, I just pray to stop applying the Caesar law, which is applied by the U.S. this month. It increased the risk for the Syrian people. So it's like, what is the Syrian or the Caesar law? I don't even know what that is. 
So to ask, because I said, I was like, what, what's, what's the Caesar law? So I said, can you send me an article or a YouTube video or something on this? Like, I don't, I don't even know what this is. So I will, I'll play it for y'all real quick. It's only like a minute long. I'll turn on this music. Today, we begin a sustained campaign of sanctions against the Assad regime under the Caesar Act, named after the brave photographer who six years ago brought the world documented proof of the Assad regime's brutality against fellow Syrians. These targeted designations seek to deny the regime revenue and support that it uses to wage war and to commit mass atrocities against the Syrian people. The individuals and entities targeted today have played a key role in obstructing a peaceful political solution to the conflict by enabling the Assad regime to wage war against Syrians. For more than nine years, the Assad regime has inflicted violence upon the Syrian people and committed innumerable atrocities, some of which rise to the level of war crimes and crimes against humanity. It is time for Assad's horrific, needless war to end. Today, the Assad regime and those who support it have a simple choice. Take irreversible steps towards a lasting political solution to the Syrian conflict in line with Unsker 2254 or face ever new tranches of crippling sanctions. So that was a statement put out by the U.S. Department of State um, from their YouTube page. And so, um, you know, I guess I don't really know that much about it, obviously. Um, I never even heard about it. So I need to go in and do a little bit more research and find out what's going on. But uh, some of the people, they just said that they were worried that it was going to have those crippling effects, that it was really going to uh, do another level of damage to the economy. One of my friends sent me the inflation rates and I calculated those. Hold on, let me get those. This is like Lebanese pounds, but whatever. It doesn't matter. Any currency, foreign currency to the U.S. dollar. So if this is your base year, the top line, <clears throat> it's one to one. We'll do this in our example. And basically what I'm trying to do is is double it. So 100% inflation rate at each period. So in the beginning, it takes one lira to get a dollar. Cool. After that first 100% inflation, uh, now I have to come up with two liras to get one dollar. Another doubling again, another 100% increase. Now I got to come up with four liras to get my same dollar pattern continues 8 to get 1, 16 to get 1, 32 to get 1. So in a very similar fashion, you could you could do a different ratio. You could, you're just, obviously you're just 1 times 2 is 2. You're just multiplying by 2 at each level, right? That's what a doubling is. So 100% increase. So now, now I need 2 more of what I had before in order to get that same dollar. So that would be 100% inflation increase. So you could do it 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, or you could do 50, 100, 200, 40. I'll show you how to figure it out on the uh, calculator just because it's fun. I mean, it's interesting to know how it works. Uh, the bottom line that we're going to look at is over a 10-year run, we're going to see cumulative inflation of 517%. I'm going to look at a little bit about what that would mean that we're looking for and I'm just going to see how we got there. So again, remember going back, when you start with your base year and you want to see 100% inflation, you're just multiplying by two at each level, right? It means now I need two of those foreign, foreign currencies to get $1.00. So one thing that we could do is if you go back and you remember, you look at that original example, you could start with the ending currency in our, our left hand, our simple example where it doubled each time we went over five periods. And so it was 32 at the end. So one thing that you can do is you can open up a scientific calculator. You can hit that second button. And if you hit log two, it's basically saying how many times do I have to raise two to what exponent do I have to raise two up, up to, we know it's five. So two to the fifth is 32, but it'll give us what the exponent needs to be if we we're just doing something really simple like that. So basically the basic formula is then is you take the, the ending currency ratio, the 32 to one, you divide it by the beginning, which in our simple example is just by one, so we're still at 32. And then we're gonna say log two, how many times did it, did it double basically? So it doubled five times. So that would be a cumulative inflation of 500% over those periods, which we knew that because it was, it was 100 at every level. It was 100 the first time, 100 the second time, 100 the third time, 100 the fourth time, 100 the fifth time. So it took us exactly to 500%. So five is equal uh, to 500%. Um, so now let's go and, and let's do that other example. So the other example was the ending currency in 2020 was 1,700 Syrian pounds to one US dollar. And in the beginning, the baseline year was 47. So we're going to do the Ending divided by the beginning, 47. And we're gonna hit that same log two. And that's how we get to our 517% cumulative rate of inflation. Now we know that was over 10 periods. So 51% inflation 
per year, which is really awful. I mean, it basically means that it just gobbles up any of your savings. And in some of those years, I mean, there was definitely more than a doubling, more than 100%. So what that would mean, I mean, it's basically like, say today, if you're saying, say your mortgage is like 1900 bucks. Well, all of a sudden, if it's like, you know, double that next year, all of a sudden you, you owe $4,000. So, I mean, it's not a big deal if your if your salary also uh, increases, if you're also, you know, given huge raises and there's some kind of COLA or something like that, you know, rate adjustment. Um, but of course, I mean, obviously no one has to give this to you. And usually the salaries lag quite significantly if your student economics, that the the inflation rate sneaks up like right now. We see big increases in the cost of food when, you, when we go to buy groceries. But I bet any of those people that are still out there working, those, you know, 85% of those of us that are still working, um, it's not like you got a, a 20% raise or something for us is down and some other things are down, but you get the general idea that basically the salary bumps really lag um, and the, the changes in, in commodities and everyday goods really jumps up quickly. So that is the big problem about going back to uh, Syria because people already don't have any money. And I showed you some pictures about Damascus and some of the problems. Now I have friends that are working in Syria, you know, and it's, it's not a big deal. Not, it's not great for them. Uh, they're some of the kind of the best and the brightest. Um, they're very talented individuals, so it's not surprising to me that uh, they're working. But for a lot of people, um, as mandatory like uh, military service and things like that, and so I mean, you know, uh, it's just really rough. I'm not going to say that I have an opinion. Uh, that's not really what I'm here to do. I'm just trying to inform. Uh, you guys saw the video from the Department of State, and then you hear a lot of these people, uh, you know, young people, Assyrians, saying, "Hey, you know, this is um, this is really going to cause even more problems for the economy." So I, I don't know. I don't know if people are going to go to Turkey. If they're going to try to, I mean, certain countries may take them, but like in Lebanon, it was at least seven years ago, the UN stopped registering refugees officially. And that was because of some problems with um, political problems. Um, if you give uh, refugees political rights, like rights to own property, rights to own businesses, rights to vote, rights to, you know, uh, have their children become citizens, then it really disrupts like a lot of the... Um, the local people, you know, the people that have jobs, the people that have businesses, the people that have voting rights already, like it really uh, changes everything up. Like we saw earlier in the video, uh, one out of every six people in Lebanon, uh, is a non-native, right, is a refugee from somewhere else. And uh, that was very true uh, in Jordan as well. So you can see a lot of these uh, countries politically like sway everything so much uh, for the voting blocks that it's a, it becomes a political problem. So that leaves refugees a lot of times without, I mean, without money, you know, business rights, um, and so they're really stuck between a rock and a hard place, you know, um, they can't really go back yet, especially if there's no jobs. Um, so, um, I don't know, uh, but I thank you guys for praying. I think you guys for spending the time to think about it and to educate yourself a little bit about, uh, people that you've never met who live on the other side of the world, who speak a language you can't speak, who maybe are concerned with things that you never experienced. I, I know that's so hard, um, to try to relate to and connect the dots, but, uh, I just, thank you for your prayers on their behalf. Uh, 